Hey, everyone, we'll just give it a few more seconds. Okay, it's 1131, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the weekly seminar of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University. We are very excited today to have Adam Bonica with us discussing his new book, The Judicial Tug of War. Adam Bonica is an associate professor of political science at Stanford and an affiliate of the CDDRL. His research is at the intersection of data science and politics with an interest particularly in money and politics, campaigns and elections, judicial politics and political methodology. After the talk, we'll leave about 30 minutes for Q&A and for a discussion of the book. If you have any questions at any time during his talk, please go ahead and add them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you who are interested in asking your question directly to Adam, please let me know so that I can sort of call on you and try to indicate a, a cue, a line for who, who's going to ask questions. Um, but still go ahead and also still type the questions to me so we can get a sense of where the discussion is going. Um, and hopefully some of you will be able to talk directly if the technology cooperates. So without further ado, Adam, please go ahead. Thanks, Dee. Um, so I'm glad to be presenting today. I'm presenting um, on a joint project with my son at uh, Harvard, Ken Harvard Kennedy School. And uh, the title of the book is The Judicial Tug of War. And it's a, uh, a broader look at the sort of political tensions that have emerged within the, in the American judiciary. Um, but uh, a main theme of it is the way in which lawyers and bar associations have, have shaped um, the incentives around the American judiciary. Um, I'm going to focus on one um, aspect of the book today. And so the central theme of the talk I'm going to give today is, uh, is that the American courts, I'm going to argue, are too powerful. And that a lot of the ills and a lot of the, the um, energy and tension that exists around um, uh, issues of judicial selection, the Supreme Court, judicial reform, um, are all emerge out of this simple feature of American politics, that the American courts are very politically powerful. And this is a major departure from what we see in other advanced democracies. And so what Maya and I uh, try to bring to the table here is sort of an explanation for how the American courts have gotten so much more powerful politically. And uh, we, we advance uh, uh, a, um, a story that's a bit different than um, the typical story that we have, see, we have sort of seen to try to explain this. Um, and our story is that what has happened is that the legal profession, lawyers and bar associations, have essentially captured the judiciary, so a whole branch of government. And that this um, has given rise um, to a, a term, a phrase that has been used to describe the American legal system, adversarial legalism, which is essentially a um, description of the very litigious and um, the very legalistic political system that we have in the United States. Um, and we argue that this is not a consequence of political culture, uh, something along around the lines of Americans being really eager to have lawyers in positions of power, but rather it's more of a consequence of an interest group politics story and one about regulatory capture. And, uh, and by regulatory capture, we often think of you know, the banks um, having too great of influence of regulatory uh, uh, going on of the Treasury Department or the SEC. Um, but there's an even stronger sort of connection between lawyers and bar associations and that of the courts. The courts in the United States are the sole regulators of the legal profession. So Congress does not legislate to regulate the legal profession. Um, lawyers and bar associations, bar associations have fought very hard to make sure that in each state, the state Supreme Courts are the ones who decide what happens in terms of the regulatory environment around lawyers. And that this has been the key to the preservation of the self regulate the legal professions distinctive self-regulation that only lawyers, not democratic processes, decide how the legal profession operates. And we also make a, a case that this has been done to advance the economic and political interest. 
And why we think this is important um, is because this sort of linkage between the interests of lawyers and bar associations and the way that the courts have been structured has given them very strong incentives to make sure that the courts remain very powerful. And because lawyers are not only powerful in the realm of the legal system, they're also extremely well represented, as I'll show um, in our other elected law offices. Um, that has had really huge repercussions over the years um, and has made the United States stand out very significantly on, on measures of how the legal, legal system is functioning, but also in ways uh, that really matter to our political system. And so some of the consequences of the capture judiciary that I'll talk about is that we have, uh, we have ended up with the legal system in the United States. It's very much structured to serve uh, a small slice of the wealthy population and corporations, and it tends to, to exclude the poor um, from effective legal uh, services. Uh, it has also um, been a main driver, we argue, of the really rampant politicization and polarization of the judiciary. When the courts are so powerful, making decisions on policy uh, that, that are huge, have huge ramifications from things uh, like, uh, sh uh, like voting rights, which of course are extremely involved in, um, all the way to same-sex marriage. Uh, we wait for the Supreme Court to decide a whole bunch of our policy, and that's highly unusual uh, to the rest of the world. And because of the political power that has been bestowed upon the American judiciary uh, over the past few centuries and continues today, um, they have become this sort of unresistible prize that politicians are responding to. That politicians feel the need to control politically the courts in a way that's very damaging to the way that we sort of ideally expect the courts to operate uh, and how they very much operate in most um, advanced democracies. And, and then I'm gonna end, up, end off with a little um, discussion about uh, prospects and reform. So um, to get started, uh, this, this sort of argument that we're advancing um, isn't entirely new to American politics. In fact, it's one of these sort of originating features. Uh, going back to uh, uh, de Tocqueville, uh, who was writing on the early American Republic. Uh, he spent a lot of time writing about the importance of uh, 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 American lawyers to the political process. Um, and he famously uh, wrote that if he were asked where he would place the American aristocracy, he would reply without hesitation that is not composed of the rich who are united together by no common tie, but that occupies the judicial bench in the bar, judges and lawyers. And uh, Essentially, he was making an argument that in Europe, they had inherited an aristocratic system. Um, there was a vacuum in the United States. And his observation at the time was that this was very much filled by the legal profession. Um, at the time, they were called men of letters. And, um, and this was a very important pathway to holding any type of political power in the United States. And they had replaced this traditional aristocracy. And this is a feature that surprisingly really sort of has persisted to contemporary American politics. Um, so some surprisingly maybe, uh, some maybe surprisingly stats about lawyers in American politics, just to give a sense here. Um, first, there are more lawyers elected to the house than there are representatives from all 24 states, west of the Mississippi and Illinois. Uh, and remember lawyers are a very small, they're only half a percentage of the total adult population. Um, relative to the average citizen, millionaires are about approximately 10 times more likely to be elected and serve in Congress. Lawyers, by comparison, are 100 times more likely relative to their size of the population. Uh, lawyers are the only profession to have ever claimed a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate, and they've done so in 44 of the past 50 Congresses. Uh, and lawyers now and pretty much always have been, have made up 100% of the judiciary. So there's one profession um, which has very distinctive um, uh, economic and political interests um, has been extremely powerful in the American system. And uh, you know, it's not that much of an overstatement to say that lawyers have written, acted, and directed um, much of American democracy and the story that has happened at the elite level. And you can see um, where Tocqueville was coming from, that this was a, this is a long historical trend that has not seen a great deal of change over the entire course of the Republic. 
going back to the very early Republic, uh, this is showing the share of congressional seats held by lawyers um, in the House and the Senate. And you can see through most of American history, uh, a majority of elected members uh, of Congress have, have been from the legal profession. Only relatively recently has it gone under 50%. Uh, but still they are remarkably overrepresented relative to the size of the population. And much of the decline we have seen has been due to the um, increase of competition from other professions um, that claim many of the traditional advantages that lawyers had claimed in terms of running for elected office. Uh, this is a distinctive feature in American politics. Uh, this is showing the, uh, in a comparative sense um, if you look at other countries, the number of lawyers uh, per capita on the x-axis and the percentage of uh, members of national legislatures with a background in law, uh, you can see that there's a, there's a relationship here and it's probably reinforcing that the, the larger the legal profession is and the more powerful it is, uh, the more representation they'll see in a given legislature. Uh, but at the same time, the U.S. is still uh, to this day a pretty remarkable outlier on this graph. Um, and it's reflective of the very um, uh, strong political power that, that, that lawyers wield um, uh, throughout the American political system. Uh, a brief note on why this has been sustained. I, I won't focus on this too much, uh, but a lot of it actually seems to have to do with money and politics. Uh, that if you go to a um, elite law school, for instance, uh, most of your classmates are going to be donors within 10 years, and they're going to be generally have pretty deep pockets. And when you're running for office early on, uh, one of the most important thing you do is fundraise. And you can't really do that from anyone that you don't already know. And so this has become a huge early on advantage that, that lawyers have maintained over a long period of time. Uh, and has sustained sort of really high rates of lawyers in Congress to this day. Um, and so there's a pipeline issue here that, that has been sustaining, sustaining it. Um, and it's important to note um, at, at this point that when you ask um, American voters whether they prefer lawyers to be in Congress, uh, they say no. <laughs> the, the vast majority say no. Most say, most say that that's not the profession that they want to see better represented. And there's a lot of evidence that they're not actually advantaged by uh, at, the, uh, at the polls, that voters aren't um, uh, selecting lawyers per se, but rather the candidate recruitment process is. Um, but this is all part and par parcel of the larger story about um, American legal profession, uh, political power. And so to give that background, we're looking at a very powerful profession, but we not often don't think of it in the way that we think of other, other industries. Um, so this is a, uh, so a key part of the um, argument that we advance is that to really understand what's going on uh, in the in long term in American political development up to this contemporary day, you really need to understand this relationship between uh, lawyers and the bar association, uh, bar associations, and uh, and their grip on self-regulation and the capture of the American judiciary. And so this is you know back in the early 1900s, there was a lot of effort to um, detach sort of the, these monopolistic industries like Standard Oil um, from their gra grip that they had over um, Congress and different political institutions. Lawyers in, very, in a very real way have maintained this throughout the entire course uh, of American history and do very much today. And they have an additional advantage, which is if you want to become a judge, you have to go through the legal profession first. And so that creates a really strong jumping off point um, for political capture. And what has emerged from that is a system by which um, uh, judges are those who are, 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 are in, uh, empowered to uh, regulate the legal profession, but judges are part of the legal profession. And you can start, sort of see how that can emerge and potentially be problematic from an accountability perspective. So I'm gonna, and so I've, I've sort of provided some data on all this, but I think it's really helpful to see this in action. So I'm gonna show a video that was uh, published by Global Witness. Um, this is, so what they had done is, uh, they, they're, they're an international organization, uh, NGO that, that is trying to combat um, money laundering, um, money coming from developing nations 
um, that's, that, that's being funneled uh, through American law firms. And what they did is they had a, um, a journalist pose as a German attorney representing a, um, a West Af African um, mining minister with a salary uh, equivalent to that of a teacher in the United States, but needed to move $15 million into the United States. Uh, he met with 12 different um, uh, firms in New York, um, and only one of them said no to the, to the request. But this is probably, this is probably the sort of uh, most telling uh, example uh, of these interactions that this, that this um, journalist, journalist posing as a lawyer had. They don't send the lawyers to jail because we run the country. To run the country? Still do. I love it. Still do. <laughs> I can say some lawyers run the country. <laughs> so you are, you are some of them, two of them. Yeah, so I'm, I'm still members of a privileged, privileged class. Yeah. So how, what does it mean you want to run the country? Uh, it means you... We make the laws, and when we do so, we make them in a way that is advantageous to the lawyers. We make the laws. Some people say we selectively enforce the laws. Another way to look at it is uh, the old adage a good lawyer knows the law and a great lawyer knows the judge. Okay. Now, in point of fact, I went to law school with half the judges who sit on the New York State Supreme and the Federal District Court in New York. This happens that way over time. You oh, always do, you can go to lunch with, you can be members of the Bar Association. Are they going to throw a case for you? No. But they, are they going to bend over backwards to be courteous to you? Yes, if, they are. If his name now would. Uh, by the way, this is uh, the, the next one that I'm going to skip uh, for time reasons is uh, an, inter an interaction with. Um, the then president of the American Bar Association, who also offers advice on how to launder money through the United States. Um, but this is um, sort of generally part of a larger issue within American politics. So if you have a legal profession that's unaccountable to the public interest, um, you end up with having a legal profession that probably is less likely to serve the public interest. And this, I think, has been a real stopping point for a lot of uh, progress and sort of advancing the, the interests of democracy in the United States. Uh, a couple quick points on sort of uh, highlighting um, some of the things that uh, uh, that law firm partner that I just showed you was making a point of. Uh, it's not just in the courts. Uh, you see uh, a great deal of evidence that lawyers are willing to defect from their uh, from their party party and how their uh, other members of the party would vote. Uh, when issues uh, arise that affect the legal profession directly. Uh, and this is just showing a set of, um, uh, of acts, uh, acts where, or legislation that went through Congress um, where lawyers voted as a block as opposed to um, uh, uh, with their parties, which is a pretty unusual thing to happen. Um, and in each case, when that happened, they always voted in the direction that the ABA had prescribed. And so this, this sort of reinforces that there's a lot of legislative power bestowed upon lawyers, and that has been the case for a long time. And this is part of the reason why Congress has not been active at all in reforming the legal, legal system in ways that would advantage um, uh, a broader segment of the population. Uh, there's also a great deal of evidence that we uncover um, that there's pro-bar association bias in the courts. So bar associations are extremely important, especially at the state level, um, for judges to get uh, appointed. Uh, they often have to go through merit commissions, uh, which, uh, which provide bar associations direct input into who can become a judge at the state level. Uh, we also see it at the federal level uh, with the ABA issuing um, recommendations, uh, whether the Senate should confirm certain nominees. Uh, they have a great deal of power in that process, but also in elective in, in states where we elect judges, uh, bar associations remain extremely powerful as well because they provide recommendations and, and financial resources. But you see this this uh, pattern in which, uh, if a bar association is sued for say um, at antitrust behavior, which is very common among bar associations. Um, I've just provided a lot of evidence uh, of that um, in a brief period of time. There's a great deal more. Um, but 
And, but even in those cases, it's extremely rare for bar associations to lose, even if, even if the case um, uh, provides a very clear example. And there are, um, and this is showing the, every time a bar association has been sued in the US district courts and the US um, uh, uh, appellate courts. And um, showing the average loss rate for a regular party versus a bar association. Uh, the point is, bar associations pretty much always win their cases when they're before judges, uh, regardless of the merit of the claims. And this again sort of empowers the, the legal profession in ways that are probably antithetical to the interests of the public at large. And so why do I think that? <laughs> because there's a fair amount of evidence that we're not as, as as citizens uh, getting the best out of our legal system. Um, and so argument is that part, one of the um, symptoms of what, what we term judicial capture, the, the regulatory and the cultural capture of the courts by the legal profession has led to a um, legal system where on the one hand, we have a huge number of lawyers uh, relative to the population. So this is uh, the US compared to other OECD nations. So the US is the larger um, uh, circle here in green uh, compared to other OECD nations. So you can see that in the US, we have a lot of lawyers. So we should be able to provide legal services to uh, the population. Um, and if you are a lawyer in the US, the, your revenues that if you work at the top law firm um, greatly exceed that that we see in other um, advanced democracies. Um, uh, nearly double the, the second um, most lucrative legal market, which is the UK. Uh, and the downside of this is when you look at uh, rankings of accessibility and affordability of say civil justice. So this is your ability to get a lawyer if you have a claim against say a landlord or, you just, or an employer. Um, what, how accessible and affordable is that to an ordinary citizen? So the World Justice Project has rated um, 140 countries on this measure. Uh, the United States ranks right now around 110th in the world behind you, Afghanistan. Um, we have a system that is very lucrative to lawyers and leaves out the rest of the population um, unless you are extremely wealthy and able to provide to um, purchase those services. I think the best example of any individual doing that would be the former president, uh, Trump, who has used the legal system in ways uh, that allowed his wealth to translate into outcomes that were way more favorable to him. Uh, and that he had been doing this his entire career. Uh, another issue that we have with the legal system that um, requires pretty urgent reform is our criminal system, uh, where Americans overwhelmingly believe that our criminal system is not impartial and it is not fair and that it is discriminatory and we are way behind our, our peer nations on, on this measure as well. And then the other alarming statistic that we're all a little more aware of is incarceration rate. The percentage of the population that we incarcerate in the United States is just completely out of line with what we see in other systems. And that likely has to do with the fact that um, to get effective criminal defense um, uh, is a very difficult thing to do if you don't have um, uh, the, the financial resources to do so. And the public defender system is pretty underfunded in the United States as well. And these are all things that have to do directly with sort of reasons why you would want to reform uh, the American legal system. And, and these statistics sort of show the urgency of, of doing so. And it, it really sort of holds back, I think, a lot of um, progress on the uh, on sort of advanced democracy in the United States because people often feel the system is um, biased against them, that it's rigged against them. And one way that they have a really good claim on that is that when you look at these, uh, how the legal system operates, it's really hard not to make, uh, draw that conclusion yourself. Um, lawyers and the sort of power of lawyers and, um, their econo and sort of economic inequality is another metric where you sort of see how this relationship has emerged. Um, this left graph here is showing the percentage of national legislators with backgrounds in law. So it's sort of the, a general metric for the political power of lawyers in a, in a given system. This is led internationally and is on the y-axis is the top 1% share of income. So we're looking at sort of a, a, a very widely used measure of economic inequality. And you can see the United States is a pretty substantial outlier for both of these dimensions. Um, and then when you break this down at the state level within the United States, you see a very similar um, pattern emerge. 
that where there are there's lawyers are afforded more political power, we, we see a relationship or correlation uh, with, with income inequality. And when you, if any of you in the audience have worked in a, a big law firm or know someone who has, most of your day is spent uh, protecting, sort of helping rich corporations and individuals keep their money. Uh, that's the business model. And we put a lot of resources into that as a society. And, and that I think is one of the key, key reasons why th this correlation probably um, has some, some substance to it. Now I'm gonna move uh, briefly over to the other, uh, other part of the, uh, the book that um, I think is important. When we're talking about um, polarization, politicization of courts in the United States, uh, these really knock down adversarial fights that we see about Supreme Court nominees, a lot of this has to do with the fact that the courts remain so powerful and politically that they're making legislation, um, that they're unaccountable in a lot of ways to Congress because it'd be extremely difficult for Congress to get over veto points, to get over the filibuster and uh, get, the, get the president on board to overrule court rulings. And so the courts right now are immensely powerful. And so we see these fights and we see these fights not take out, uh, take place in terms of Congress versus the courts, but parties in Congress fighting over who gets to pick seats on the, on the Supreme Court and other courts. And what this is showing um, is uh, the sort of polarization on uh, across the judicial hierarchy. And one of the things you can see is you start out attorney with attorneys, that's the distribution, ideological distribution. So further left is more liberal, further the right is more conservative. Um, attorneys uh, are a little bit of a left-leaning profession. When you look at the lower courts, um, they look like a pretty close to mirror reflection of, of attorneys. So these are less politically important courts. You get to the state Supreme Courts, you see a much greater uh, level of polarization. Um, and we see the same pattern emerge at the federal courts where administrative and magistrate judges who are probably the least important in judicial hierarchy uh, tend to be less polarized. And then you move all the way up to the appellate courts where we see um, a, a greater and greater uh, uh, polarization. Uh, this has been something that's been playing out, something we were able to track with a lot of data in our, in our book project. Um, but, you, but going back to the 80s, we've seen a pretty consistent increase in the, the total partisan polarization of, um, uh, uh, of, of the federal courts um, more generally and of the state courts as well. Um, and right now, the courts, if, if you look at the ideology of Republican and Democratic members of, say, the circuit court, they're about as polarized as Congress was in the mid-2000s. And, and this pattern has been increasing, and it, it looks like it will continue to do so. One of the reasons why you can see it emerging um, is as the courts have become, as Congress has become less politically powerful, as gridlock has taken uh, hold, there's been more emphasis on making sure nominees to the courts um, fit the, the ideological preferences of the, the, the appointing president. And you can sort of see this pattern emerge um, where there's more consistent um, ideological selection among uh, presidents uh, over time. So to wrap up um, this larger argument, so that a lot of the, the um, parts of the, the, the judiciary that we, we sort of find ugly in the American system, I think really do link back to the, the problem that unlike in other countries where the courts really are at the bureaucratic periphery, um, deciding not policy, but, um, uh, but procedure and uh, how, how bureaucratic systems and, and dispute resolution works, uh, really has um, raised the temperature uh, around the courts uh, in ways that I think are very unhealthy for American politics and American democracy generally. And so there's been a lot more talk recently about prospects for, for reform. Uh, the most common pro re reform um, proposal that we hear is court expansion. Um, and so, so in increasing the size of the Supreme Court, that is something that um, probably makes sense in the short term, but I would argue does not solve the larger underlying problem in the long term. It's more of a solution to a symptom uh, that right now is more problematic for Democrats than it is for Republicans, uh, because Republicans have defected pretty egregiously on uh, the norms surrounding judicial selection. Uh, but even if we were to expand the courts, may, one good thing that would do is it would reduce the value of a given seat. Uh, 
uh, on the Supreme Court, but it wouldn't reduce the political importance of the courts, which I think is the underlying um, uh, problem here. Uh, another um, uh, reform uh, uh, measure that has been suggested is to try to establish a rule of seven within the Supreme Court, which I actually think I'm, this would probably be my favorite of the, of the proposed reforms uh, these days. And basically the rule of seven um, would mean that to overturn um, uh, legislation that was passed by Congress and, and the president, um, you would need seven justices to support that as opposed to the, 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 the five uh, that we currently require. And that would require much more consensus and would probably lower the sort of stakes that we see on the Supreme Court um, in a way that would probably be helpful to the country at large. Um, there are other reforms that I think need to happen more generally, uh, one being strengthening alternative pipelines to holding elected office. We need to have a more diversified Congress so that we can really think seriously about reforming the legal profession and regulating it in the interest of the public. And then another one that is borrowed from Western European traditions is having not just law schools as a, as a pathway to um, a, 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 the judiciary, but also but having a separate set of schools that focus on, on, on training judges, that there wouldn't be intertwined as one profession. Uh, in other Western European countries, it's much more common to think of as judges and lawyers as actually two different professional tracks and not of the same um, general interest group. So um, I, uh, that's where I'll end here. And so I'm looking forward to um, uh, seeing everyone's questions. All right, thanks so much, Adam. What a fascinating book. Um, sounds like there's a lot of material in it. Um, so first, we, there aren't many questions yet in the Q&A. If you have questions, please go ahead and type them in. You don't have to read them out loud. Um, I'm happy to still moderate the questions and pose them to Adam, but please feel free to ask. Um, so I do have a lot of questions for Adam, but I'm sure we don't wanna just hear mine. So the first question is that, you know, the first things that Biden has done is either undo a bunch of executive orders or implement his own executive orders. And that is the result of a general shift away from governing purely through the elected representative institute, institution to begin with, Congress. A lot of the dynamics you're describing about politicization of the judiciary have coincided with an era of more gridlock and less negotiation in Congress and a lot of sort of deferring to the other non-elected branches to govern. So what is the relationship there between congressional politics and a rise in either the politicization or the activism? I'm not sure if you and Maya try to measure that of the judiciary. Yeah, um, I, I think there's, I think you hit on the, the, the main point here is that, that as um, Congress has become more gridlocked, more hamstrung in being an effective policymaking institution, uh, it has ceded its power um, to constrain the other institutions that, that have direct policymaking power. And so we see it's very hard for Congress to overturn an executive order or, or intervene and, and change um, aspects of the bureaucracy uh, because it's hard for Congress to do anything. Um, but the courts very much have been able to be much more aggressive on a number of, of um, dimensions in the way that they're making policy. Um, and the courts are much less accountable to the public as well. And so I think some of the um, examples would be, like a good example would be Citizens United, uh, a hugely unpopular uh, ruling by the Supreme Court. No one really asked for it other than a small segment of the population. Um, the court knew it was quite unpopular. And it was even unpopular, like a majority of Republican voters, a strong majority opposed. Um, uh, oppose uh, uh, allowing corporations and, and labor unions to give directly to politics. Um, and yet Congress can't do anything about that. Um, in a different era, back in the say 30s or 60s, you would have seen court, court curbing behavior, uh, which is essentially when, um, uh, uh, when Congress uh, passes new legislation to um, uh, uh, to, to overturn something that the courts have done. And that's sort of really sort of an accountability mechanism that had existed. But we have seen almost none of that behavior at the federal level. Um, and the state courts is much more interesting, sort of some of the patterns we've seen. Courts are very powerful there as well, but we often see uh, less constrained and less gridlocked state legislatures. And often the way that plays out is we do see more court cribbing at the state level, 
but there's also been a great deal of effort to reform the judiciary in ways that advantage the majority party. So if you're in Kansas, where lawyers tend to be, tend to be very liberal relative to the population, um, they had a merit, merit commissions, which meant that basically lawyers got to pick uh, or had a lot of say in who was, who was nominated to become a judge. And there was a great deal of effort from Republicans in the state to go to partisan elections for judges because it wasn't a system that was producing judges that, that were ruling in their, in their advantage. And so we had a lot of conflict emerge in states where the, the legislatures were less constrained. At the federal level, the Supreme Court just gets to do what it wants um, and there's not much Congress is able to do. Okay, um, so we have a question from one of our CDDRL postdocs, Salma Musa, who is in your department, uh, who That's says awesome. that you have some very compelling patterns and analyses. What weight do you place on some of the positive externalities that come with a highly professionalized pipeline of lawyers, like high quality public prosecutors and pro bono work for disadvantaged groups? Yeah, so any system, right, is going to have um, like real trade offs. And um, in the American system, like having uh, a lot of human capital and talent uh, within our legal profession does have important some and some positive um, externalities. Um, one would be, right, we do have a very high, high power prosecutorial um, system. The Justice Department, at least historically, has been staffed by very confident, uh, competent and, and very well-trained and serious um, uh, 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 lawyers. And that's not something to scoff at, <laughs> given that some of the challenges that other countries that have failed to regulate entry into, um, entry into the bar uh, have seen a lot worse behavior. Um, we're seeing, I think we're seeing a deterioration of that to some extent um, when, you know, when we look at the president's attorneys and what we saw in the aftermath of the election uh, and the run up to it, it's not purely the, the most, um, uh, uh, the best and most talented lawyers are able to do that. The other area where I think there is some positive externality is that within corporation, lawyers have a lot of power and they're a strong force for regulatory behavior and keeping cor corporations in line with regulations, um, because we've, in a way, largely privatized um, a lot of the regulatory system in the U.S. to lawyers. Um, co corporations are way more afraid of a, a lawsuit than they are from regulatory action from the SEC, for instance. Whereas in the EU, you care a lot more about the regulators are doing than, than a class action. Okay. Yeah. So we have another question now from a postdoc at CDDRL, Nate Grubman, who is going to hopefully be able to ask directly. Nate. Thank you. This was a very interesting presentation. Um, I just, I, you briefly pointed to the recent decrease in the percentage of Congress made up of lawyers just in the, the past few years. I was interested in hearing more about um, that trend and what you see as uh, causing it. Yeah, and I guess first I should say, given the, the time span of that graph going back over two centuries, recent means in the last like 80 years, and it's been a pretty gradual trend. Um, but there are, there are a few things that, that coincide with that. First is um, uh, that there has been a increase in sort of levels of education in other professions um, that have grown in size, right? Um, so, and, and these are uh, generally professions that produce individuals that can, uh, compete uh, for um, uh, political office uh, on the same terms as, as attorneys, right? So in, in, the, in the distant past, uh, you know, a large percentage of the population was illiterate. Um, we're, not, we're not in that, in that state anymore. And so some of those structural uh, human capital advantages that lawyers had were no longer as advantageous as they were in the past. Another thing that's happened is that um, when we started to see that decline was around the time when we shifted to direct primaries. So in the 1920s, 10s and 20s, uh, where we used to have um, uh, sort of an old boys club that decided who was gonna run for Congress in any given state. And those clubs uh, were dominated by lawyers themselves. And so there was a, um, a lot of sort of self-dealing and who was selected to be the party's congressional candidate. And that system as it, as it deteriorated, um, that, that was sort of, uh, lawyers had to compete um, on the terms for the most part as other, other candidates. Um, I mentioned that they really advantage in the fundraising process, 
Um, doctors have a similar advantage, it's not as large, but there's also a reason why doctors are relatively really well represented. Um, professors uh, and academics don't have that advantage because we don't give each other money when we run for office. Um, I don't know why, but that's something that you see pretty consistently. And so I think those are two big things. There's a third one, which was the establishment of bar associations, which meant that you couldn't just, if you just wanted to go into politics, the entry costs of becoming a lawyer first grew substantially. So you had to go to law school as opposed to going to your local inn and reading a bunch of books and having someone train you. And so sort of that, that's when the jumping board became uh, much more expensive um, in, in terms of costs of time and, and financially than it had been in the past. Okay, so we have two questions now, one from Frank Fukuyama and then after Frank, Eric Jensen, I'm going to try to allow them both to talk. And Frank and Larry Diamond are actually asking the same question. Yeah. So. Frank, did you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, actually, I had two very uh, different questions. One was, um, you didn't mention term limiting Supreme Court justices as one of the ways of reducing the stakes in uh, Supreme Court uh, confirmations. Uh, so that's one. And then the second one is, in this uh, expansion of uh, judicial power, how important do you think Roe v. Wade was? Uh, the fact that this important social policy decision was taken by the court rather than by where I think it should have been done uh, in the legislature. Uh, you know, those are the two questions. Um, yeah, the first one, uh, I, I should have included that. I, I just, uh, I, I forgot to include it, but yeah. So um, I, I think that um, a term limiting is a, uh, something that should be done. Um, uh, in, in, in terms of sort of lowering the stakes. It's, uh, to, you know, this goes back to sort of uh, FDR's uh, reform, reform efforts. Uh, and I still think it's probably a good idea today. I, on, the, on your second question, um, uh, I think sort of that era, and actually we draw a bit from your writing in the book on this, um, you know, it, not just Roe v. Wade, but also sort of how the courts were central in civil rights, um, uh, uh, resolving civil rights issues in the United States, where we now sort of as a society give them a lot of credit. But as Frank has written, uh, in other countries, it's, it was typical to see this resolved through legislative institutions, and it seemed to happen quicker in other countries as well than it did in the United States. Um, and uh, you know, it, when we bring in these, these issues that are hugely important to um, politics, right? So Roe v. Wade is a great example where we have an issue that's very salient in American politics uh, and one that no one expects the legislatures to do anything about. And they have basically, and the legislatures have basically decided, okay, we're just gonna leave this to the courts and we're gonna fight over who's on the courts so we can resolve abortion uh, issues. And that's um, problematic. This is something that would be much better resolved through through democratic processes um, directly, and um, it's not just abortion where that's true. We're now at the point where it looks like voting rights are also there if we don't reform the the filibuster, um, and uh, a whole variety of other issues. Um, and uh, so I, I think Roe v. Wade was one of the first big. Um, uh, big examples of this sort of filtering into the political system in a way that has just sort of ex, has led to sort of this ex, like the public um, sort of just uh, uh, normalization of the idea that the courts are the proper institutions to be deciding these issues. And I, I think that has been problematic for quite some time now. Okay, so next we have a question from Eric Jensen. Going to Eric. Yes. Uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, Adam. Uh, full disclosure, I am a lawyer. I used to be a member of bar associations. I'm no longer. I figured that there's no way I'm going to go back to the practice of law at this stage of my career. Um, I uh, also had the same question as Frank and Larry about, about term limits, but I'll ask you a couple of others. Uh, one is... Um, Bar associations, you know, function like uh, most any guilds. Mm -hmm. But one function that the ABA has performed well is vetting judicial nominees. Uh, Trump ignored ABA uh, recommendations and appointed many unqualified uh, judges. 
So I'd like you to comment on that. I'm not a huge fan of all bar association activity, but uh, uh, in that particular activity, I think they perform a, a, a worthwhile function. Uh, I'd like you to elaborate, my second question is, I'd like you to elaborate on your idea of judicial schools. Uh, when, and I've made a lot of reform recommendations on judiciaries around the world, but I like to think about implementation. And if you're proposing a, a, an entirely separate judicial track from a, a, a law school track, uh, I see it as uh, pretty profoundly unimplementable. Uh, so if, if you're proposing uh, pre-service training, uh, uh, for uh, judges, I think those that sort of activity is is feasible. But I'd really like you to expand on on uh, judicial education, which, by the way, is is not entirely uh, uh, separate from you know a foundational legal education. Yeah. Um, so so I'll start with the first uh, point about our associations and their their um, uh, function in sort of rating and assessing judges. Um, a little bit of history on that. So um, the ABA was first invited um, to provide um, a ranking the, or assessments of judicial nominees uh, back in the 50s under the, the Eisenhower administration. Um, this was at the time Republicans pushing back against um, what they saw was efforts to uh, politicize the judiciary um, by Democrats. And at the time, uh, the bar, so bar uh, lawyers in general were very Republican, um, uh, a very Republican profession, the most Republican profession, uh, given the data that we have going back in time. And so they were very strongly on the, on the political right at the time. And so if, and if you didn't have some sort of merit assessment, uh, what you would get was um, uh, a, 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 Oversampling essentially your select your nominees um, from the, the 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 part of the, the legal profession that was liberal, which was a, was a relatively small minority at the time, and so Republicans were pushing back against that, and they wanted to bring merit systems. So let's select judges based off of merit. The reason they wanted to do that is because it advantaged them. If we only selected judges off of merit and we didn't bring uh, part of uh, politics or party into the selection process, they would have got a bunch of Republican judges. Fast forward 50 years, uh, the legal profession had reversed. Now lawyers are predominantly liberal, and you, you see these same arguments being made, but reversed. Democrats are now very much for merit selection, whereas Republicans are very much against it. Um, and it's because it's the same political interests that, that have emerged. I think the problem with having lawyers select judges is I would be less concerned with that if it weren't the fact that they were also the chief regulators of the legal profession. If you want to um, provide input uh, into um, who should be a judge, I understand that, that, that like competence should be like a minimum criteria for being a judge, uh, but I'm also confident that Congress could do that on their own. And at the state level, we see a lot of blocking out of other interest groups that try to try to provide assessments as well the bar associations essentially say only bar associations are allowed to say whether a judge is qualified or not. And when they do that, they're selecting on lawyerly qualities. And that might not be what we want for a judge, which is sort of transitioning into um, the second part of your question. Um, and I know that so floating sort of the idea of judicial schools is sort of a little further out there. I'm well aware of that. Um, but I do think like in the long term, it's something we should think of in terms of how we should think about separating the the judiciary from the, from the legal profession. When you were trained as a lawyer, you were trained to start with an outcome, um, or at least if you're working in a law firm, you have an outcome you want to get to, and you have an adversarial system where you're supposed to represent your client. Um, and you need to do your best job of figuring out how to get from the evidence and the information through discovery that you have to support the interest of your client. Judges should be playing a very different role. They should not be uh, trained in adversarial legalism. They should be trained in adjudication. And they, I also think they should be trained in uh, skills like empathy, compassion, uh, things that you could probably focus more on if you had a uh, education tract that was, that was geared towards becoming a judge rather than becoming a lawyer and then a judge. And also sort of the professionalization you get as a lawyer really does matter. So showing 
uh, if, you, if you come into the profession as a lawyer, you're probably gonna be more deferential to the, to the legal profession when you're ruling on issues that relate to it. Um, and as I showed, there's a great deal of evidence that that's happening at, in mass. And so I would argue that like, this would just be one way to sort of drive a wedge between the two and really sort of think as a society, maybe we want different types of skills for someone who's gonna be deciding cases as opposed to someone who's gonna be arguing them. And so that would be my case for it. Um, how feasible it is, um, I, I won't get into that too much, uh, but I do think that say, say Stanford started their own judicial school and had some donor to do it. Um, maybe those people could become judges and maybe that would be a good thing and that would be a start. Uh, but the broader issue, I do think we're talking about centuries of, of, of sort of institutional history here. And I do think that it, it's, this is a longer term discussion than, than, it, than the other shorter term reforms I was talking about. Um, I have a question about economic inequality in the book and the argument that lawyers have made a lot of money, that it's a really sort of rent seeking, there are a lot of opportunities for rent seeking, um, and as a result, profits have tracked wider economic inequality. Lawyers are also, you know, a service profession. They work for interests that have become more concentrated and wealthy over time. So since the 1980s, Wall Street, the rise of the financial sector, uh, we live in Silicon Valley, so the technology sector, um, there are any number of sectors that have just driven economic inequality in a far more direct way than lawyers. So is the argument that there's something about lawyers qua law legal profession that has driven inequality, or is it just the fact that more resources, well-resourced sectors can purchase the legal services and you know, pay more for them, which has then made the legal profession more wealthy as well. I, I, it, so my take is more of the latter. And this is, this is something that, that um, Justice Brandeis had written about pretty extensively, referred to the Janus of the legal profession, where uh, one, one face was looking towards public service and uh, the other face was looking towards, uh, you know, economic profit. And at the time, the elite bar associations were very, very intertwined um, with, with these trusts then, um, that, that had dominated the economy. We see this still today, right? So these elite law firms that have the best attorneys and produce the best results, um, are, you, can't, you can't afford them if you can't pay $1,000 an hour. And that's, uh, you know, that's an exorbitant fee to be charging. Um, a, a ordinary citizen. And so I think part of it is that all this legal firepower is um, directed in the interest of, of those who can, uh, can afford it. And the legal system, I think is, there are other ways in which the legal system is quite important in reinforcing inequality. I don't, I would probably say it's less of a driver and more of a sort of sustainer of, of inequality, something that makes it harder to reverse. And um, like a couple of reasons. One is sort of like the development of, um, a, a, of the wealth protection industry, where you can go and figure out how not to pay taxes and do it in a perfectly legal way, or at least one that's not going to open you up, up, you up to too much liability, which we've seen, you know, this is something that goes through law firms. Um, that's, you know, there, these are the services that uh, some of these law firms provide. Um, and the other way is through intellectual property rights, which I think is a larger discussion. It's not just about the legal profession. Um, but the legal profession has played a pretty key role in um, sustaining sort of more aggressive intellectual property behavior on behalf of large corporations and individuals. Okay, so I'm going to group a few questions here at the end about reforms that other countries have taken. Dinsha Mystery is saying that in some other countries, students can join the bar after completing an undergraduate degree in law. That's also true in some mm -hmm. Western European countries. So law can be a really popular major, and that's a way of reforming a bar association, creating a lower barrier to entry for the profession. Marcel Fafchamp is asking about using lay people as assessor judges. That is That happens in some European countries. Um, and finally, Steve Krasner is pointing out sort of that having a legal system that's independent may still have advantages um, over uh, some of, you know, one that's more embedded or more regulated by democratically accountable means. So Sorry, that was a sort of fire hose of questions, but in our final five minutes, could you address those? Yeah, so generally I think um, the entry, like the entry requirements to the bar are probably too high in the United States. Like if you get, I mean, at a minimum, if you can graduate a, with a law degree, uh, 
the bar exam should not keep you from practicing law. We would have more attorneys, um, uh, often from um, uh, from different backgrounds, that would be able to provide more legal services to more of the population. There's something like a third of people who have been trained as attorneys who are unable to practice because of bar, but they weren't able to pass the bar. And um, you know, that's the bar is there to provide a level of competence. And so I think that's important. But I think we like reforming. Um, that sort of uh, filtering requirement, I think, would be probably very beneficial to providing services more generally to the population. Um, and so, like, there's there are these reforms uh, at the sort of like entry level, but um, uh, probably the um, system where I think that, that does this best in, is the Netherlands, where their their solution to the problem was they're going to they set up. Um, legal clinics, which were not staffed by attorneys, but they were staffed by people who did this for a profession. If you have a legal issue, but you couldn't afford an attorney, it'd be like you go to a medical clinic, but you go to a legal clinic. And this came through like the deregulation of the legal profession in the Netherlands. And it's something that's been very beneficial to the population at large. Um, the UK has recently, in 2007, uh, implemented a number of reforms of, uh, upon the legal profession um, that had uh, required more emphasis on uh, indigent defense and um, the types of fees and rates that could be charged. Um, so, like, so our closest parallel is that I, uh, in, the, in terms of the legal profession, um, we have at least some example of where reform has happened and has not been traumatic. Uh, and I think a, a larger historical narrative that's worth mentioning here is that um, part of the reason uh, the legal profession has advocated for uh, self-regulation is that going back to the time of monarchs, um, there were lots of fights over who could have access to attorneys. Um, there were times in, in, the, in the, the British monarchy where only the, the, the king was able to have access to attorneys. And so there have been long historical fights over who can get, who can have advocates um, advocate on their behalf. And I, I think that like there are obvious trade-offs to having a less, less self-regulated um, legal profession. They may be um, under more political influence, but I do think uh, generally self-regulation has not been a good model for any, any industry. And I think it's really problematic when that lack of self-regulation feeds back into the political system in a way that makes it much harder for people to have their voices heard democratically when it comes to issues of the legal system. Okay, um, in the final two minutes, so we have a question about if there's a sort of systematic difference between Republicans and Democrats in the percentage of lawyers in Congress, like does it vary by party? And finally, would the reform about rule of seven require statutory action or, or action at the judicial level, like who would implement that rule? Um, so the first question, there's, there's slightly more Democratic attorneys, um, but that's uh, Democrats, uh, uh, Democratic lawyer legislators in Congress, but it's not a huge difference. It's like a 10% difference. Uh, there's a pretty proportional number of lawyers in both parties. Um, and for the, the, the uh, second question about the rule of seven reform, it, it's hard to see how that would come from Congress. That would have to be something that was negotiated probably between Congress and the president and, um, and, and the Supreme Court. And so it's, you'd have to, like this is probably again, a longer term reform that, that needs to be discussed, uh, but it would have to be similar to the rule, that, the rule of four that exists um, in the Supreme Court, which is if you want a case to be heard or to get through the cert, a cert process, you only need four judges to, to agree upon it, whereas it could be a majority. And you'd have to shift that to in these certain cases when there, when we want to rule something unconstitutional as in passed by Congress, not just sort of uh, a civil rights uh, case against an employer or something, um, then we're going to have to invoke the rule of seven um, just to sort of lower the, the temperature of the courts. And so there would have to be buy-in for the Supreme Court directly. Okay, well, thank you so much for this talk today and congratulations on the judicial tug of war, which is out now, everyone, if you're interested. Thank you so much, Adam, and good luck. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, bye. Thanks, everyone, for coming.